Ani, Bojo, I'm sorry that we're a few minutes late. That was my bad. I was late. So apologies if anyone was sitting waiting. Um, but welcome to another SON Environment Office webinar. Uh, this webinar is a series that we're doing uh, with Bruce Power to share uh, with SON community members more about ways that Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Environment Office and Bruce Power um, the ways that we engage on environmental matters and environmental issues related to Bruce Power. So we already did one webinar where we talked a little bit about the connection between the Coastal Waters Monitoring Program that's run out of the Sun Environment Office and Bruce Power and sort of how we came to develop uh, that program collaboratively and how it works to begin to um, give us better ways to engage in knowledge exchange and to solve problems and to look at the environment of the lake and the interactions with uh, Bruce Powers operations. So today we'll be talking a little bit more specifically about some of Bruce Powers operations and the ways that they interact with the environment and um, Joining us again to talk about this will be Sherry Lee Feisch, and I don't know if anyone else from Bruce Power that's on is going to be speaking, so maybe just Sherry Lee. Um, and she's going to be talking a little bit about Bruce Power's operations, specifically the once through cooling system and the ways that that kind of interacts with the environment and then the different sort of environmental approvals that Bruce Power goes through around that system. And then we'll kind of talk a little bit about the way that uh, the Sun Environment Office and uh, Bruce Power work together through those approvals processes. So um, yeah, so I don't know, Sherry Lee, if you just want to start maybe by, for people on the line, just introduce yourself and your role at Bruce Power, and then um, we could start the presentation. Okay, thanks, Kat. Um, so I'm Sherry Lee Feach. I work at Bruce Power. Um, my job is the Environment Regulatory and Research Manager. So I work on our Environment and Sustainability team and have a great team of people that we work with. Um, we do all of the environmental monitoring. So we do the verification monitoring in the natural environment um, to verify that all of the effluents and emissions, which we take great strides to minimize, um, actually just to confirm that that's the case. Do a lot of work on the lake, which is amazing. Uh, we were able to be out there even this week to get water quality samples, do some fish work, get our temperature loggers all figured out. So um, it's a busy time of year, but it's great. Um, so I just wanted to again like, talk today about some of the cooling water, uh, specifically the intake side and what that meant for fish impingement and treatment and our Fisheries Act authorization. And then at the end, we'll cover permit to take water. And then I have a slide that shows multiple regulatory interactions. So I think as we go through Kat, I might just prompt you to join in so you can explain how we go back and forth and, and talk. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna great. share. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna share. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, I can only share the entire screen, which means I won't be able to see you anymore. Okay, hold on. Let's see you for a second here. Uh, uh, Okay, so can you, oh, can you see this presentation now? Yep, it looks good. Okay. Um, so yeah, our discussion today is gonna to be on fish and cooling water intake interactions. And just to start, this is an aerial view of um, the Bruce B and Bruce A at the Bruce site. So in the foreground in this picture is the Bruce B station. And I like this picture because um, you can sort of see that curved channel, that's our intake channel. So that's where the water's coming in, in from the lake and traveling up um, through the pump houses. And can you see my cursor? Yeah, yeah, use the cursor, that'd be great. Right. So you can see here, this is the intake channel. So the water is getting pulled and I have a diagram in the next slide, but it's getting pulled from the lake bottom um, through here by pumps that are located in the pump houses, which are these buildings here. So there's um, four pump houses, there's one for each unit. And then this is the station itself. So this is the, um, we call this the secondary side. This means that it's the non-nuclear side and then the nuclear side here, um, vacuum building. 
And then, so the water I'll show you, but it comes in this intake channel. It'll go through those pump houses, get screened, and it comes out the discharge channel. And at Bruce B, we have this nozzle on the discharge, and that helps us um, with that water coming out and mixing well in the lake. And we're not talking about the thermal portion today. We're only talking about the intake, um, but we'll have a session on the thermal uh, later, I think, in the series. Um, and then over here is Bruce A. Uh, you can't see the intake and discharge um, from this angle. Uh, it's similar, um, and we can maybe show a picture of that in a future webinar. Um, so this is the, the site in general. This is Douglas Point. I think you've, if you're boating at all, you see this pretty predominantly from the lake. Okay. So this is, uh, again, now is more of a schematic view of um, Bruce B here and Bruce A. And uh, Dave put this together so that you can see where the intake is. So the intake um, is on the bottom of the lake and there's a tunnel under the lake bed, that, that's why it's a dotted line, that brings the water from that location into the floor bay. So you can see at Bruce B, it's at a depth of 14 meters of water. Um, generally, and 830 meters offshore, and Bruce A is at a depth of 11 meters and 550 meters offshore. Um, of course, Bruce A was built first, followed by Bruce B. So here's a better view to understand what once through cooling is. So what it means is that um, we're taking water here from the lake bottom, it's coming into the floor bay um, and going through some screens. And I'll show you the, the screen in this minute. But so it's coming in here through the floor bay, through the pump house screens, and back out. Um, so this water is used to condense the steam. So it's a its own complete separate system. It moves through the system. Uh, the reactor is its own system, and then it interacts with the steam. So the steam cycles between these two. It picks up the heat here, comes goes through the turbines, and then this once through cooling is used just to condense that steam. But they don't they don't interact. It's all a series of tubes that uh, allow that condensation to happen. Um, and then the water is heated and gets discharged. And there's of course limits around that. Um, so when we're screening out the material coming in, um, that includes the any fish that are coming in, and we have a wash that we use to collect and monitor those fish. And as we'll go through this today, you'll see there's quite a lot of federal and provincial uh, regulations for this. Um, so for the, the fisheries portion, it's under the Fisheries Act with the Fisheries and Oceans Canada or Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, for the water taking, that's with the province under the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks and they regulate how much water um, we can come in every single day. Um, and then of course, do a lot of work um, with yourselves to then also understand what this means, understand some of concerns or other thing, discussions around these issues. And we've done a lot of work together as you'll see as we go through this. Um, so starting back now at the lake, just to give you a better schematic of the cap. So the cap is a little bit recessed into the lake bed, so it's designed to be flush with the lake bed. Um, it's quite large across, 38 meters across. Um, and then there's a, a tunnel that comes under the lake bed. So again, the schematic here, uh, we just highlighted. So on a, on a super clear on this aerial day, you could get an idea of where the cap was and we drew it in um, so you can get a sense of exactly where it is from um, A. You couldn't see it at B so I just have an overview here of B again. Um, but this is best practice so our intake caps um, as you'll see in a video later on will demonstrate how they reduce that velocity coming in and also make it lateral so that fish can detect it and um, move away from it. So that's the best practice. Also having them here more further offshore so we're not in that near shore zone uh, where the smaller fish are like Kat's talked about in the coastal water monitoring program. Um, that also helps um, have fewer fish come in. And then in addition, um, we were built on the Douglas Point headland, which juts out into the lake and is a high energy zone. So it's naturally a place that's not so diverse in fish because it's such a high energy zone with the wind and wave action on the point. Um, so we have avoidance, avoidance um, by the location. We have mitigation measures in place being the velocity cap and it being offshore. And then in addition to that at Bruce B, we have a chain rope barrier. So it's like this chain mail that hangs off of the cap here um, at Bruce B. And that flows back and forth and helps deter some of the schooling fish like shad, for example. 
Um, and then there's just some um, more statistics up here uh, telling you what the flow is. So maximum amount of flow coming through um, Bruce A is 175 meters cubed per second. It's a little different at Bruce B at 193, just because the pumps are a bit different. Um, and then the flow at the cap. So again, it's designed to be uh, quite low for, again, best practice to minimize fish coming in. Um, so this is the layout of our pump houses. So on every pump house, uh, there's three big uh, condenser cooling water pumps, and that's the, the main pumps that are drawing that water in from the lake. Um, and this is a picture here of our intake channel. This is at unit four. And you can see up the intake channel, we have these screens. They're uh, like a coarse screen to keep out um, big debris. And then the water comes in through a traveling screen, which I've just represented by these boxes. And they're just a rotating screen um, that again, helps filter out now smaller particles. They have a three eighths of an inch mesh. So anything smaller than that uh, gets sprayed off and they, it all comes down to the end where we have a fish basket in place. And this is a picture of the new fish baskets at Bruce A. Um, and that's where we monitor. So we monitor this every single day. And then in addition, we have a low pressure service water system um, where there's smaller pumps and uh, some smaller screens. So all of this material uh, is monitored here at the end. So a little bit more now about fish impingement monitoring. So this is conducted every day at all of our units. Um, there's a form that's standardized that gets filled out and on the form uh, we record every the fish species that we see here. We count how many there are of each one and get a sense of their lengths. And we need to do this in order to um, calculate what that biomass is um, and we sum that up for the year. Most of the fish we see coming in are gobies. Uh, we get shad uh, in bigger numbers usually in the spring, but it could happen a little different times of year. And we see some suckers, those are the main species. Um, and we work um, with Asanio. We share these, uh, what's coming in on a quarterly basis as well as our annual reports. So now with our Fisheries Act authorization, we submit an annual report every, at the end of March every year, and we share that and go through that together as a group. So um, there's lots of great information here. So if you're interested in, in learning more about that, uh, we can provide more detail or talk more about that if you like. Um, so as part of the oversight of this so environment, our team oversees the form completion, the quality assurance of those forms, um, and we have training for operations to be able to identify and monitor the fish and fill in the forms correctly. Um, in addition, in every unit we have a freezer, so if they're not sure of an identification, um, they can freeze the fish. We also have them freeze all the white fish because it's hard to tell the lake white fish and the round white fish apart. And that's an important distinction because as you're aware, the lake white fish are um, important for the commercial fishery. And uh, so we want to make sure that we're identifying the, them correctly and separating them from, from the round white fish identifications. Um, so that's there. And then in addition to all this, um, we have inspections by the CNSC and uh, SANS participated in those inspections. I know the um, CAT and her team were able to come and walk down these units as well. And that's also helped us lead to improvements. So for these new baskets at A, um, there were fish that were able to overflow and not be counted as well as they could be in the sump. They're hard to see. So that's why we've modified baskets and taken in um, some of the recommendations and tried to implement them to really always improve our program. Um, so that's been a really great partnership. And as I said, we use all of this information to calculate our annual losses. And we report these um, every year to the DFO, but also in our annual environmental protection report that is posted online every year on May the 1st. And so you can go to the Bruce Power website and look at that, and it has the detail of all of our environmental protection measures, including um, impingement and entrainment. And you can see here just the trend over time. Um, so just generally, that's about 2,000 kilograms of fish using our loss metric um, it, it, overall. Did you want to add anything, Kat? I'm kind of going on here, but did you um, speak to anything? No, I think like the only thing I was thinking as you're talking, like I understand this stuff well, and I was thinking that, um, you know, it's really hard to visualize this system 
and like how it works um yeah. without seeing it and I remember yeah, the I first know. time that I went to the intake channel and the pump house mm -hmm. and I suddenly was like oh okay I, I understand this now but it took me a while to understand it and it's not that complex of a system but I think um like this type of overview really helps and and for me I think of it like there's the the very large and it's hard to understand the scale of these things too right like the the um the intake uh cap the, the it, or the intake is very large and it's pumping in a lot of water and when you're standing just for people to visualize it when you're standing along the intake channel where the water comes in it's flowing like a river and there are fish and other aquatic things in there living and then as the water gets pumped into this pump house what's up on the screen right now that's when you'll get any fish that actually get pumped in get pushed up against these screens so they aren't sucked through the plant um and then you can pull out any fish that are on those screens and I'm not going to say anything else. Are you going to talk about like impingement and entrainment or should, okay. Yep. Okay. No, entrainment. Yeah. Cool. I just thought I'd mention entrainment. Stop there, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start and you can. Then. Well, I was just going to say, we'd say, we might say these words like impingement and entrainment a lot. So I was just going to say like, when we talk about impingement and entrainment, that's been one of sort of the key areas of interest and concern for SON over, you know, a long period of time and has led us to more of this collaborative work, collaborating with CNSC on the inspections out of the pump house, all of that kind of stuff around those concerns. And so impingement basically literally means large fish being impinged upon and onto these screens. That's impingement. So we're talking about relatively large fish and then in train or fish, I don't know actually right off the top of my head what the size threshold is. But then when we say entrainment, we're talking about very small fish and larval fish and eggs that are small. And so they don't get pushed against these screens. They get sucked through the plant basically with the water and presumably maybe come out the other end, right? But so I think just talking about what those two things are and then yeah and you can go ahead to talk about like the entrainment part is obviously more challenging to understand entrainment impingement is a little bit more straightforward to understand because of the pump houses the fish are on the screens you see the fish you know what fish are being impinged what fish are susceptible to the intake entrainment's a little bit more challenging because there's no, there's nothing to stop. There's nothing to stop them. So you can't really just like reach out and count them in the same way. But Sherry Lee can talk about some of the things that are being developed and, and have been worked on over a long period of time to like get a better understanding, for example, of things like, like entrainment. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I shouldn't have omitted the definition. I apologize for that, but thanks for helping me with that. Um, so for the entrainment monitoring, uh, you can see again on the pictures here. So um, we used a large plankton net and lowered that into the four bay before all the units. And I don't have a picture exactly, but um, even in this top picture, you can't see where the where the units end. It's actually past this bridge. There's another bridge even farther down. Um, and that's where we did the entrainment monitoring at Bruce A. So we were really uh, cautious to make sure that we did the monitoring before any of the units, before any of the water was brought in uh, to really get a full picture of everything coming in from the lake. And this was a challenging program. We did this year round. Um, we had to have this complex rope system to be able to safely lower and raise this large net into the the four bay. Um, again, not an easy task. You have to be pretty strong to do this, this job. Um, and we did this year round. So you can see here the snow. We did this uh, like in the winter, which was challenging. In the winter of uh, 13, 14 was one of those years we had a whole 
whole pile of snow and um, even just to get into the building we had to shovel it out anyway it was a huge ordeal in the, the winter of, of this time um, but it was important to look at what was coming in year round we of course focused our efforts more in the spring when you'd expect to see more larval fish just based on the fish life cycles um, but we did want to get a sense of things year round so what we did is we'd lower this net in um, allow it to sample until um, depending on the day the length of time would vary so you can all imagine that when you put the net in the water if there's a lot of algae or debris it'll get clogged up um, much more quickly and you can't sample as long um, versus on a day when you don't have, have some of that algae loading um, you could sample for longer so so we looked at all that we understood how much flow was going through that net while we were sampling um, and then they would uh, wash down the net like Jamie's doing here and we'd uh, sort them uh, right away in the building and we'd be looking for the larval fish um, taking them out as well as the eggs as best we could. And then this would get sorted again. Um, but we did this right away to understand if the fish were still alive or if they were long dead, because if they were something that was like a long dead fish, it was dead before it came in. And there weren't that many of those, but um, those were taken out of the calculation and we focused on the live ones and the eggs, of course. And these were all sent to an expert um, uh, in the U US for identification, um, just to confirm, but we do have good, better methods we're working on. So for example, for improved fish identification coming up, we're working um, on DNA and eDNA methods. So for these, um, you take the fish tissue and you run them through, um, well, that's an assay experiment to determine what that fish is genetically from the tissues. You can get an identification that way, uh, which is more reliable, of course, than just the visual identification, just because these are really, really tiny. Um, and there's specific things you have to look for. And, and sometimes it might be close to something, but I mean, for those of you that know a lot of the, the Cisco's, the whitefish are very similar um, morphologically. So being able to differentiate them more by genetics would be really helpful. Um, and also as part of that work, we were looking at eDNA. So eDNA is environmental DNA. And what that is, it's not the actual fish tissue, it's the water that the fish were in. And being able to look at what that water is and what the DNA is in the water. So it's from like the scales they shed or from anything that the animal has shed. Uh, you're able to pick that up in the water. And we wanna see if we can use that as a way to get a relative abundance or indication of what might be present. Um, so you can only use it for presence, absence, and we're also working to see if there's a link to abundance, which no one knows quite yet, but we're part of a larger project with the University of Toronto and Nick Mandrake's lab, um, as well as that's part of a bigger project at the University of Windsor called GenFish. It's a huge consortium of people. Um, so we're really working on improving that. Um, and some of those samples now. So we're working with them now to help do some larval toes and uh, Kat's team with the CWMP is also doing those toes to give them some material to start to sample to move that project ahead. Um, so what we're doing now is we're planning our entrainment pilot. So I'll explain a bit later, but as part of our Fisheries Act authorization, we have a plan for ongoing impingement and entrainment monitoring. And we wrote the plan as best we could with um, the techniques at the time, but we wanted to leave it open to develop um, improved techniques and to run some pilot programs to look at efficiencies and, and ways of running the program um, more often potentially. Um, so we're looking at uh, conducting the pilot. We've had to delay it with COVID. So our plan is now for um, spring of next year and uh, possibly the following year with the need to update that plan by March of 2024. Um, and then we're planning to run again the year round program starting in 2025 and then repeating in 2026. Um, if we see a, a, a big difference from when we ran this last in 13-14. So when we ran this in 13-14, uh, it took us at least two years to plan, probably more. Um, so again, the cycle is continuing and I think um, there's lots of improvement here. And uh, also just to say that um, we're looking uh, for, again, for support. So ideally like having um, SON for these inspections, but maybe also to help come and see the pilot and participate in that as they like. And we had that as well with the impingement monitoring. So when we first started some of that work um, back in, uh, 12 or 13, 14, we also had a SOM member do some of that with us. So it was really great to have um, that connection. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Kat. Yeah, no, I think you did a good job. There's a lot of, there's a lot of really cool work and a lot of sort of creative 
things that you have to do in this situation of trying trying to figure out like eggs, larval fish, that kind of stuff. So the DNA work is pretty cool. Um, the environmental DNA is super interesting and we may have to have a webinar solely about that because Bruce Power is doing some eDNA work and it literally, it sounds either really nerdy or sci-fi depending on how you think about it. It's literally just taking a water sample, analyzing that water sample and being able to tell which species of fish swam through that water basically or were in that water at some point and uh, coastal waters monitoring pro program is also part of what Sherry Lee mentioned the genome the gen fish project and working with university of toronto and because of all the huge number of sites coastal waters has they'll be doing uh, eDNA samples, water samples next to each of our netting sites and basically using it to compare what do we collect in our net versus what do they get in this water sample and what does that tell us about, you know, how long does DNA stay in this water, um, how does sort of is DNA moved from offshore to onshore if you have big wave events. Anyway, there's a lot of questions, but it's definitely a really interesting um, line of research and could potentially help us to understand a lot more about what's going on not only in the lake but what's going on you know in operations such as Bruce Power and it could be really also applicable to other you know operations that involve water in any way so yeah it's pretty cool yeah we're pretty excited about it we're also excited to not potentially improve on this older method so more data more year round would be amazing so we appreciate that um, so just a little bit about the Fisheries Act authorization. Um, so there were three aspects to it. One is an application and there's a form that they asked you to fill in. And it was a very comprehensive application. I've just put some of the pieces here on the slide. Um, so you obviously had to say, you know, your location, your operation, where you're taking water in. Um, but then also understanding the, the local fish and fish habitat. Um, FCO is the fish community objective. So these are set by the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission for the whole lake. So it's to understand how um, your work uh, ties into those and understanding kind of the broader uh, needs of the ecosystem. Um, as well as looking at the, so as I said, the whole pur pur purpose is to avoid harm, first of all, then to mitigate it, then to offset it. So um, I discussed how we avoided it with the headland and then mitigate it with the cap. Um, but then they go farther than that to say, well, is the cap effective? How do you know? Do you inspect it? And we do. So there's uh, things in there, conditions in there that we need to report on, on that as well. Um, it asks you to look at other contingency measures. Is there further things you could do? And for us, that also tied into the um, mitigation measures assessment that I'll talk about. And then after those many, many things, the, the heart of it is really getting into quantitating what your annual loss is. So what that means is we have to quantify the amount of fish impinged and the amount of fish entrained um, to come up with an annual value of what a lot, how much of the, the fisheries, the fish biomass was lost um, from those two things. And the real challenge then is you have to offset that. Um, which is great. It's just, it was hard to marry together the loss um, metric that we used. And then when we go to do an offset project, what the gain metric is, those two things have to be apples to apples. And that methodology did not exist. Um, and so we did a lot of work, our, our team and a whole bunch of uh, experts that helped us to figure out a methodology for that comparison. Um, and then in addition, when you get into these calculations, especially on the entrainment side, um, there's a lot of refinement to do, a lot of looking at the flow, scaling things to flow. Um, for all of these fish species, we need a life history parameter estimate, which, which is basically looking at um, the parameters to convert them into a biomass. You can imagine that we little larval fish, uh, we have to translate all of those to a common age, which in this case is age one. And to do that, there's a series of um, math that you need to do. And for that math, you need parameters. And for some of these things, parameters either were hard to find or they were for other areas. So we were really careful to understand what it meant for like Huron or the Great Lakes before we started looking elsewhere for those uh, parameter estimates, for example. Um, so a lot of work went into this. 
And then for us as well, fortunately, unlike Huron, uh, we're in a beautiful part of the world. We don't have a huge amount of like shoreline hardening or, or things that have kind of affected the natural environment on our lakeshore, which is amazing. Um, but it also meant it wasn't easy to find a project for offsetting. A lot of people focus on uh, wetland ecosystems and with the dynamic nature and the energy along the shoreline here, the wetland ecosystems sometimes are a bit farther back in. So you can think of like McGregor Point Park where the, there's a wetland complex, but it's not right on the lake shore. Um, so to be able to store, restore a coastal wetland on the side of the lake wasn't a straightforward project either, which is kind of the go-to. Um, so for us, uh, we did the Truex Dam removal. I'll show you about that a bit more. Oh, sorry. Um, and then we'd also, because this process took a really long time with the back and forth um, with developing the application and getting through the calculations. Um, in the interim, we did lake trout stocking. So we asked the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, what projects would be beneficial. And this, their suggestion was the lake trout stocking that they're doing anyway. Um, it's to help restore the Keystone Predator at the top of the food chain in the lake to help um, support the ecosystem. And uh, so we did support that for a couple of years, um, but in the process of going through the authorization and looking for offsets, uh, we're understanding that this wasn't really something that was supported, especially um, with SON, just questions about the strain that's used. Is that really the best way to restore the lake? So that in the end, wasn't something that we continued to pursue. So that's why we look for other options. I don't know, did you wanna to add to that cat a little bit? Um, yeah, I think the only thing I'll say is like, just again, to put it at the, the highest level is that, you know, this the Fisheries Act authorization is something that came later, like that was required later from Bruce Power to do as part of their operations. And the Fisheries Act authorization is really just an extra level of, you know, regulatory oversight in terms of potential, you know, DFO and the Fisheries Act regulates harms to fish and fish habitat. Right. So we know that, you know, the harm that Bruce Power is causing to to fish is related to that impingement and entrainment that we talked about earlier. So like that's the purpose of that Fisheries Act is to prevent or reduce harms to fish. And then the authorization is a really regulated way to ensure, you know, there's some standards and some reporting that uh, Bruce Power has to do to DFO. And then the third part is this well, you're doing a harm, so now you have to offset that harm in some way. And Sherry Lee's totally right. We also saw, it, like we racked our brains, like what type of shoreline restoration or rehabilitation project could we do? And couldn't really come up with a great one. And, and we did have a lot to say too about the lake trout stocking. Um, Bruce Power had done that at the advice, you know, of the ministry of a good project because that the ministry does continue to stock lake trout and uh, community members will know that's something that Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, we've said like, we don't really understand what lake trout are doing to the lake. We're concerned they may be impacting um, sort of the stability and the health of lake whitefish populations. We don't, we don't love that as a way to offset harms. So this is why we we'll talk about this I'm sure next, Bruce Power had decided to do the Truex dam removal project, which I think Shirley will talk about, but um, there were other things in there like, and she'll talk about that next, is Coastal Waters Monitoring Program was also part of the Fisheries Act authorization, and there are other parts of that um, in the Fisheries Act authorization that was Coastal waters, the Truex dam removal, which increases fish production in an area of the Saugeen River. And then the third thing that maybe we'll talk about is also, um, instead of saying we have to do all these re rehabilitations right now and they all have to be massive, saying maybe Bruce Power can work with, with SON on a few, a few other um, fish habitat restoration, rehabilitation, or improvement projects around the territory but we don't know exactly what they are yet. And we, we need to think about that and consider what's important to community and, and assess that a little further. But I'll stop there and let Sherry Lee talk about these offset projects um, that kind of are their positive impact for the, the, the impacts of operations. Sure, so I'll start like I think with the, the Truex Dam. So, 
Um, the dam was in Walkerton. It's on the Sogging River, obviously. So as you're probably all aware, Sogging uh, River, huge watershed draining into Lake Huron. Um, we, of course, wanted to stay as local as possible. Um, and so this is it's certainly very local. And uh, this dam had been in Walkerton. It was 100 years old. Um, it was blocking fish passage. They did have a fishway. It wasn't really that effective. Um, and so we looked at partnering with um, the municipality and the fishing club to help to take this out. And to do this as uh, part of the rules under the offsetting um, plan, you have to do monitoring pre and post and try to predict to demonstrate that this project will um, unequivocally offset the loss that you have. Um, so we did a lot of uh, work and math and pre-monitoring um, at these locations. Uh, so there's 22 locations each has replication both on the main river, the main stem of the Saguin, as well as the tributaries. And these red dots are natural endpoints, either there's a dam or some other reason there that that's kind of the study area that we're looking at. Um, so we did electrofishing pre for two years before the dam came out and now we're doing it post. Um, we've had um, 20, we've had two years so far, we'll be doing it again uh, shortly um, to be able to see what that, uh, that biomass change is. Uh, we have controls in place, so it's a really rigorous monitoring program that we have to understand the biomass change um, pre and post. And then in addition, we've looked at other ways of understanding the fishery. Um, so the, the dam was a barrier certainly to jumping fish, but without it there, it's also able to let all the fish move around. Um, but for the rainbow trout that use that system, we did radio tagging. So we were, um, we would tag 50 fish spring, fall generally. We've done that for a few years now, just to show where they move. And this picture is an example of that. It's showing uh, a tagged fish. You can see it's stuck at the truex here for a long time. Uh, it didn't get it. Well, I guess it wasn't, maybe it wasn't trying, who knows in the fall, they don't necessarily move as much in the fall as they do in the spring. Um, but you can see it was able to pass in the spring. Um, and then it went way downstream and you can see again, it came back again the following spring. So we were able to keep uh, track of these fish. The tags do last a little while and it's great. We don't really know much about what the rainbow trout do in the fall. So it's really interesting to see this work. And the tracking is really intensive. Um, they do it both uh, just walking uh, by car and then also flying a small plane over to hear the, the, dip, the individual fish, which is pretty awesome. Um, in addition, we do red counts in all of these trips in the spring um, to look for the salmon and to show that they're coming back there to spawn. Um, and there's also videos and cameras in place. And here's a cute little picture of the, the smolts um, coming up Otter Creek, which is uh, here. It's this really productive little system. Um, and then I put a link to a website for Biotactic, who's the, uh, the, the person, the company that does all of the monitoring for us. They've got some great uh, information there if you'd like to look at that. So there, that's a one big project. And then of course also, and, and Kat's talked about this before and, and I'm sure you might know more about it already. Um, as part of the Fisheries Act, we have a complementary measure of the Coastal Water Monitoring Program. Uh, I think you've seen before, it's a really diverse program, covers a big spatial extent. Um, really looking at that near shore environment, understanding better fish diversity and abundance, um, setting pike nets and seining um, to better understand those fish over time. Um, I know they look at more than just fish. They did water quality, temperature, looking at that near shore structure. Um, and this is also, as you can imagine, really amazing data as we look forward to understanding more about climate change and how it's changing and how we're seeing so much variability. So it's really amazing that we can um, have this bigger uh, spatial and temporal scale, which is really great. Um, and then we're working together too to use this data for other things. So for example, at Bruce Power, I'll talk about later, we do an environmental risk assessment. Um, and that's looking at all of our interactions um, from our stations on the natural environment and understanding what that looks like. And we're able to improve on that now. We're able to pull in these temperatures from a bigger array and have a better sense of what that might mean for fish, for example. So it's it's been really amazing. Um, it's been going on, as you know, 2019, 20, and now 21. Like Kat said, she just up this morning, not for this, but still in the field right now. So that's that's great. And of course, I know she loves her crew. So shout out to them. Did you want to add anything, Kat? I kind of, anyways, your program. You probably have more to say. 
No, I like I like the addition of the awesome crew bullet point. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, yeah. no, I, that was something that we, we really pushed for with the Fisheries Act authorization because yeah. you know we, we thought a lot about um, offsets and like what does that mean? And and we don't wanna we know we know from from the monitoring that Bruce Power does and the impingement monitoring, like we know which fish species are being impacted by operations directly, like through mortality. Like we know what those are. And that's why we said like stocking lake trout doesn't make sense. Like lake trout aren't negatively impacted by this. So trying to look more broadly, right? And and we said, you know, coastal waters monitoring program seems like it should be part of uh, the Fisheries Act authorization because it does it doesn't offset the impact, but what it does is it does build knowledge and understanding of the broader lake ecosystem and how that interacts with Bruce Power. So we were really glad that the Bruce Power, I, I will I will say Bruce Power supported the inclusion of that in the uh, in the Fish Act authorization when and it was mm -hmm. actually not that easy to get it in there from the government perspective. So it was really important to like have that in that authorization as in that authorization as an important sort of, it also kind of recognized the importance of Saugeen Ojibwe Nation directly in the Fisheries Act authorization. So it kind of kept us a meaningful part of the authorization because the authorization does last for 10, it's a 10 year period, right? So it's not like a, a one year thing or a two year thing. It, it's, a, it's a longer thing. So, um, and maybe, I don't know if you put anything about the potential like rehab or um, rehabilitation or improvement projects, but that, that was also why it was important to put those in there. And we put longer time periods, like let's figure out one in the next three years but it was to do multiple projects over that 10 year period of the authorization. So I'm also just rambling now, so I'll pass it back to you. No, you're correct. I didn't put those other projects in because we haven't developed them yet. So I didn't have anything more to say than what you've said about it. So thanks. For yeah, me. but I guess the, the point, the part there, and I, again, right off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I think there's at least three, right? Three rehabilitation yeah. projects over the 10 year period. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Yep, so we need to get a plan put in, execute them. There's all kinds of timelines that they've yeah. built into the authorization, yeah. which is great. So There's all sorts of yeah. stuff in there, but the, the main point is there's three sort of rehab or projects that we could work collaboratively on. And one of the things that our office, you know, wants to do with SON community members is try to get a sense of like, are there areas that are really important to community members that are maybe degraded or people notice like the fish passage is not good. And this is an opportunity we have to say like, oh, okay, this is a project we could work on. We could improve this fish habitat or the shoreline or whatever, but we need to do some more outreach, I guess, with community to kind of see um, if there's any priority areas or specific areas of concern for people. And then we can develop those projects, but it is a longer process like Sherry Lee alluded to. You have to kind of identify the place and then you have to start developing plans and see how those work but just to say that is uh, an ongoing thing and, and we'll keep sort of working to develop whatever whatever that project is going to be um, but the, the key part for us is that it's something important and meaningful for for SON members right an area that's important or that they'll enjoy um, using yeah, and so we'll have to develop that, I think, more going forward, Kat, about how we engage that. I know you have ideas on that, but this is a good start. So hopefully people watching the webinar can, uh, can start to think about that. Um, so then the next was the assessment of feasible mitigation measures. Um, I can start this one, Kat, uh, but I think it's helpful if you jump in on the license condition portion, because again, that was a lot of the work that uh, Sana did specifically to get this as part of the Bruce Power um, license. So in 2018, um, we went through our license renewal, and of course, there's uh, many uh, components to that, but a big portion for us was the environmental protection piece and our environmental risk assessment. Um, and one of the things was, you know, we were looking to continue operations. As you know, we're going through our major component replacements and wanting to continue 
operations through the like 2064 or even more. Um, and with that, they said, okay, you know, you've been operating this long, that's great. And you want to continue to operate, but can you do more to help reduce your interactions with the lake? So specifically looking at um, fish and then thermal um, to look at those two to see, is there more that you could do to further reduce that? So understanding that we have avoidance and mitigation, but can you mitigate even more so that that's even less? And so that's why we went through and did this big review, um, which was great. Uh, we looked at all of the technical options, worked with engineering to help evaluate what if they're feasible for implementation at the plant. Um, but a key part of that was to not just look at it from a pure like engineering and Western science point of view. It's also to have listened and we worked a lot with the SON environment office, of course, to understand again what was important and how to pull in some of those values to look at these measures as well to come up with um, something that was meaningful. So it was an integrated approach. It was uh, a great process to go through. I'm really happy that we were able to come up with a product um, that I think we felt like we really worked and collaborated well on. And um, we just got the official letter this week um, to say that uh, that went really well. And that we'll look at figuring out how to update this moving forward um, based on um, new information. And so this, this routine review process that is integrated and maybe do you want to talk a bit more about the SON side of that, Kat? Yeah, I'll touch on that. Um, yeah, uh, so like Sherry Lee said, it, it was a result of SON intervened in Bruce Power's uh, license renewal hearing in 2018, I guess, around environmental sort of these outstanding environmental concerns, which we talked a lot about actually in the previous webinar about coastal waters monitoring program, because that intervention and that work is actually part of how the coastal waters monitoring program started as well sort of a way to address SON's outstanding concerns saying there's gaps on this there's gaps on this we want more you know there's a whole list of things and that's how we came with well how about SON collects that information that they're asking about and are concerned about and then we can talk about that right um so there was that but the second part was actually around mitigations which means reducing harm and so we were saying that, you know, we want to ensure that not only, you know, CNSC and Bruce Power, so Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, who is the approval authority who gives the licenses, they said to, to and in agreement with Bruce Power, we don't think there's an unreasonable amount of risk. And SON says, we disagree. And CNSC, respecting SON's perspective said, okay, so we're going to put a condition on Bruce Power's license. So that means in order to keep their license, they need to do this thing. And this was this mitigation measures assessment to look in detail at all of the ways that impacts could potentially be reduced to the greatest extent possible. And so, um, like Sherry Lee said, we did work through that process together. Um, dates are escaping me because I'm in this weird COVID haze where I don't know what you know what month or year it is but we did do community workshops i think in 2019 and we taught we had coastal waters there and we also talked about mitigation measures and we talked about we asked community members about generally what their values were around fish fish habitat what their concerns were around bruce powers operations and we used that to feed into the mitigation measures um, analysis to make sure that we were um you know, protecting SON's values or ensuring SON members' values were incorporated into that process. And so now we've got to a, a spot where through Bruce Power's analysis, they've said, here are some mitigation measures that are feasible and we can look at how, you know, how and when and, and where these might be appropriate as we, you know, go through time. So now we're in this place where we actually have an updated assessment, a very comprehensive assessment, and we know that we've been meaningfully involved in that. And now, you know, the next work will be to look at those things in more detail and determine, um, you know, when, where, and under what circumstance, you know, we would uh, look at implementing any additional um, mitigations. So, and I think that's, that's kind of where it's at right now. Like, like Sherry Lee said, they would have just got the letter because we just finished all our, our own engagement with CNSC sort of around the, the um, mitigation assessment. And, you know, we, we basically ended with, we were involved, we agree with the assessment and now 
sort of moving along to what are the next steps. So that's kind of where we're at. Great. Okay. No, I think it's been a great, great process for sure. So, um, so that's sort of it. The, so I want to move on to a different a slightly different topic that's related. Um, and this is a provincial permit for the permit to take water. So when we're taking that water from the lake, um, water takings are governed by the provincial government. You can read the um, acts and regulations there on the slide. And so there's a permit for the water taking and that requires a renewal process. And part of that is um, consultation, engagement, data collection and reporting. So the permit sets out a legal compliance for the water taking. Um, so in the permit, um, there's a, a volumetric limit and reporting requirements. They're only valid for a set period of time to get renewed. Um, and this is something, again, we've talked about in our song uh, environment meetings as well. Um, so at the Bruce site, we have three individual permits, one for the water taking at Bruce A, one for our Bruce B. And we also have a center of site intake that's used, um, was used for different things in the past, um, but now uh, has a much lower volume that's used. Um, and so these things get renewed. They were up for renewal um, in February of this year. So that was, or sorry, they, we submitted our applications for renewal in February of this year, and we've received the permits. Um, so for those, the amount of water that we're taking hasn't changed, um, but what's new this time is we did ask for some flexibility in that water taking on a daily basis. And I didn't get into the detail, but one of our mitigation measures is to look at um, changing the amount of water taken on a daily basis uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one might be in the spring if those level fish are present and we're able to take less water because the lake's cold and we don't need as much for cooling, that would help potentially reduce the entrainment of those little fish. Um, and then also in the summer, for example, when we talk about thermal, you'll see in the summer, of course, with the warmer lake temperatures, we need that full flow of water uh, to help with the, the temperature limits of the um, through the system. And so we may consider if we might want to take warm water then to balance some of that out. So, I mean, none of this is, it, it would require equipment changes at the station, which are not in place right now, um, but it's setting up that flexibility so that if the next 10 year window, we do want to move ahead with some of those um, mitigation measures we may be able to and we'll of course continue to talk about that um, as we move through and it's just it's just setting us up for success there um, so just some more details about the, what we need to provide so it's dates and times and uh, rates of water movement how much moves through per day and we have two ways of understanding that one's uh, enthalpy heat balance calculation where we look at our heat differential and use that to understand the amount of water moving through the system and another one is just to purely count how many pumps are running and use the design basis uh, manufacturing of the pump to figure out the flow which we don't like because those pumps over time kind of get worn out from running 24 seven. Um, so it's not as realistic as the enthalpy calculation. So that's our preferred method. Um, and some detail here that we report this annually by March 31st. There's an online system, which I put here. You can look at the volume of water taken every day um, in that big report. And that was it. I guess I just have an overview slide yet, but I don't know. Did you want to add anything for the permit to take water? It's a little bit more uh, cut and dry than the fish portion of cat. But. Yeah, I don't think there's really anything to add. Again, it's kind of the same as the Fisheries Act authorization. This is another uh, permitting process that Bruce Power um, has to be become a part of and it just adds an additional level of government regulatory oversight in terms of Bruce Power's water taking um, and then it connect you know and we'll have to add in later we'll have another webinar about the thermal piece so the sort of last water piece involved in this equation but I mean overall like we're aware always of the amounts of water that Bruce Power is intaking and and we know you know 90 nine how i don't know 99.9% .9 of that water is returned to the lake Correct. we know that it's heated but that's for another time because we have 2 minutes left in this <laughs> webinar but, um, yeah. um, no i think that was a good overview sherry okay, thanks. 
Um, so then I just have this final slide. It kind of sums together the multiple regulatory portions. And uh, we've talked about or approached a lot of them today. So just an overview um, of water is flowing in. I've just put a circle there. It's going through the system. Um, it's coming back out. And as we talked about today, there's the Fisheries Act for the impingement and treatment of fish, as well as on the offsetting. We have our provincial permit to take water, as well as other ECAs or environmental compliance approvals, which limit the thermal and chemical composition of that water um, that goes back out. And uh, those all get pulled together in the environmental risk assessment um, that we do every five years. And that really helps us understand sort of the interactions of operations with um, the environment. But it also gives us the opportunity for dialogues like today and overlaying um, other values and understanding what's important as well to the, the larger um, community as well as uh, your own community. And then as we've discussed here, we have the feasible mitigation measures and also maybe for a future webinar is the climate change work that we're also looking at working on together understanding what it means for our region and um, what may also be of more interest to the community so it's a high level summary and it's two o'clock I'm going to stop talking um, so I didn't know if we wanted to take any questions yeah I think if there are I know I feel like Sherry Lee, you and I are the same. We could both ramble on about these things for so long. Like I took like 45 minutes of the last session and I didn't realize that time had even passed. Um, I, I think um, I saw uh, one question was just to share the slides. So if Sherry Lee, if you're able to share the slides with me, um, I could share. Sure, I emailed them. I think it's something, Kat, if you want. Oh, great. They're probably okay. in your inbox. Yeah. Okay. And then I just, there wasn't really a question, but in the chat, um, somebody asked that, or it was more of a comment that said, I feel like there's still stigma around purchasing fish close to the nuclear power plant. And I just want to mm -hmm. touch on that. And, and I think we'll probably have a session more about um, the sort of uh, radionuclide part of things, right? And, and some mm -hmm. of those concerns. And, and we did learn through our community information sessions that we had about mitigations. When we asked people what they were most concerned about, that's actually where most people's concern came from was potential exposure to radioactive materials. And so um, that I'm going to point somewhere else and maybe April, or sorry, April's on the, the back end of this webinar, but um, we actually, around those concerns, um, we actually worked with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and they do what's called their Independent Environmental Monitoring Program. And in that program, they basically look at um, a certain radius around the plant and they test um, agricultural products. So, so like, you know, corn or, or whatever, a whole suite of agricultural food items that one might consume who lives in the local area. Also things like um, other food products like meat products, you know, beef and things like that. And then they'll also test, you know, plants, um, soil, things like that. A couple of years ago, working with CNSC, we asked them to expand that range of what they were looking at to one, include Saugeen, an area in, within Saugeen First Nation, and an area or at uh, Neashinami. And so usually they were just doing it, I think, in a 25 kilometer radius of, of the generating station. And then we asked them, can you also include uh, Neashinami and Saugeen First Nation? And so they did that. And we said, can you also work with fishermen from the communities to go out on the fishing boats, collect um, fish that SON members typically consume and test those for, um, you know, traces of radioactive or, or radiation materials. And so we did work on that and I, and we had um, a commercial fisherman collect more commercial species that would be consumed. And then we had another fisherman collect more very local to the plant too. Like uh, we had a fisherman from Saugeen go out and, and angle for bass uh, right near the plant, like right beside the plant um, and in the Saugeen River. And so CNSC took those tissue samples of those fish back and analyzed them um, for, you know, the whole suite of little different radioactive or, you know, different things that would be from the plant. And we didn't find that any of those things were 
elevated or were anywhere near any levels of concern. And I can't um, regurgitate the exact results right now, but we did do a webinar like this one with CNSC fully about that environment, that monitoring program and what the results were. So it's possible that maybe April could um, put in the chat or it's on our Facebook somewhere, the video, but there's a resource. And I think there's like a pamphlet too that went, it explained in detail the results that were found. So if it's possible um, for April can maybe find those things and uh, either share them with the person who asked later or, or just put them on with this. Cause I think the two go together and we do know there's still a lot of um, fear and concern about things like that. Um, but working with CNSC and Bruce Power, we're trying like the straight, <laughs> the straight truth is we're just trying to get to what is the truth, right? And, and really start to break down some of those trust, right? And I get that like people feel like, well, I can't trust a corporation and all this, right? So that's why Coastal Waters, that's why asking CNSC, the independent regulator to say, can you also do these other things? Because we know people are concerned about that and we wanna know we want to know what it is, right? We want to know what the truth is. So we've done these things to provide that sort of assurance for community members. So we'll try to find those links and share them. And I think there's even just a quick like two, two pager that has the results of that monitoring program. And um, I can't remember the interval CNSC does that on. It might be every five, three to five years or, or something like that. Um, but we'll also ask them the next time that they do it to also, again, include the fish part and the locations in, in Neoshinaming and Soggy and First Nation. So we keep being able to bring back that information to community. So that's my little rambly explanation. And I see April has said that she'll email the links and other stuff about that independent environmental monitoring and, and the fish testing that was done um, to the webinar. And I also know uh, another thing, again, I don't want to ramble because it's already five minutes after two, but, but we're also working with Bruce Power. Uh, maybe Sherry Lee, I think we're going to have a session specifically on this topic, but maybe Sherry Lee you could just touch on um, some of the other work around the diet survey and um, figuring out like dose to human beings and things like that. I don't want to get into it because Shirley and I will sit here till 2 30 hashing it out about it not hashing it out but talking about it just but I think we're going to have a session about that as well yeah I can speak to that briefly uh Kat so um so two other things so for the the Bruce site for the programs that we run we do look at all of those radionuclides like Kat was saying and corn and milk and all kinds of things both near and further away from the site. And that's done annually. It's in our annual report. We've been doing that for 40, 50 years since the plant's been in operation because we do want to understand um, how those radionuclides travel, well aware that we're in this wonderful agricultural community and all of those products are consumed by a lot of, by the public, right? So we do have a program that looks at that, also looks at fish. We look at fish both spring and fall and you can see the, the radionuclides that are monitored in those as well. Um, so that's something we're always doing annually. And then in addition to that uh, is the diet survey. So also from um, license renewal, better understanding of um, the different differences in diet depending on uh, different ways of life. So, uh, so we, we do a dose to public calculation. So what that does is it takes all of these radionuclides we measure, looks at how they get emitted, where they might go. We model all these things and we come up with a, a dose to public and it's been de minimis for an extremely long time, well below levels. Um, that are deemed to be safe uh, for the populations. Um, but to refine that more, we did a um, diet survey specific um, with SON members to get a sense of what they're eating, um, how much of it, how often every week, what does that look like? And we're pulling that in to further uh, update that dose calculation. And so we'll have future webinars on that, but it's something that we're updating in our environmental risk assessment as well to have. So in the last one, we had a person that was representative of a of a more um, subsist subsistence lifestyle uh, and also eating um, more fish and wild game. And now we're gonna refine that based on the results from the survey. So really appreciate the participation on that, but I think it's a great step forward for something more realistic as well. See, we have so much to talk about, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. We will be having another session and um, 
yeah, we'll have we'll have another session and we'll be we'll be talking about that specific thing um, later and aim to continue to share uh, more information about that. Oh, and is there? Nice. Is, oh, the video. Yeah. Yeah. We could, we could. Do we want to just show the video? I guess at the end, that way it's part of the recording. Um, and maybe you can also post the link. Okay. Yeah. So I know this video is going over a little bit, but there is a video that Sherry Lee has to share, and maybe we'll just say um, we'll show the video and then kind of sign off right after the video. Okay. The Bruce Power site is located on the eastern shore of Lake Huron near Tiverton, Ontario, in the traditional territories of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Our facilities use the waters of Lake Huron for both station operations and domestic applications. Cold water from the deeper offshore parts of the lake is brought into the station and run through the non-nuclear side of the plant. This water is used to condense the steam, which drives the turbines that generate electricity. While the fish habitat is protected, some adult fish, juveniles, larvae, and eggs are drawn into the station with the water. Adults and larger juveniles may become trapped against the intake screens. This fish loss is known as impingement. Smaller organisms like eggs and larvae can travel through the screens and cooling system. This is called entrainment. Together, they are referred to as I and E. Approximately 2,000 kilograms of fish are impinged and entrained each year. To put it into perspective, for Lake Whitefish, I and E losses are much less than 1% of the annual commercial fish catch. Since Bruce Power began operations on the site, we've employed a number of strategies to avoid, mitigate, and minimize our impact on the fish populations of Lake Huron. Our location was originally selected because of its natural deterrence to avoid harm to fish. The intense wind, waves, and ice scouring in the vicinity of the Douglas Point headland result in a lower species richness and abundance of fish. The cooling water intakes are far offshore at the lake's bottom, with velocity caps to reduce the speed of water and change the flow direction from vertical to horizontal. Fish can sense this and will naturally avoid the area. As well as our moral obligation to care for the environment, Bruce Power has a regulatory responsibility to track, mitigate, and continually improve to further minimize environmental impacts. We have taken steps to engage the local indigenous communities and the regulatory agencies to seek input related to the fisheries and to create projects that improve fish habitats. In 2019, the Truax Dam on the Saugeen River in Walkerton was removed eliminating a major passage barrier to the species in this section of the Saugeen River. Fish now have unrestricted passage to high quality habitat upstream of the former dam. By working proactively with the local indigenous community and community organizations, we will continue to help to enrich the natural environment and drive positive change in our community. That was a good video. I feel like the narrator explained impingement and entrainment <laughs> much simpler than I did. We should have showed him that at the beginning. We should have shown it first, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah so that was our session. I know we went through a lot and, and we went a little bit over time, but I appreciate those who stayed and listened to the session. And for those that listen to it after it's live, if you ever have any questions or concerns or are looking for resources or, or additional information about anything that we talked about today, always feel free to reach out to the environment office. You can reach us on Facebook, all of our emails are on the Facebook, on our website. Um, anytime we're happy to answer community member questions and share any information that we have um, with, with anyone. So um, we do have another webinar with Bruce Power coming up uh, June 15th. Uh, so we do have another webinar coming up um, and we'll be talking more about mainly environmental aspects of our engagement with Bruce Power. So I think actually we have about three more in the future. 
So we'll keep talking about additional, uh, we'll talk about radiological things, about um, diet surveys, uh, and we'll talk a, a little bit more uh, also about the other part of the cooling water intake system, which is the thermal part or the temperature uh, part of the, the outfall part of the cooling water system. So we'll also do a session on that at some point. So I just want to say I uh, appreciate those who stuck around and uh, your interest and uh, we'll hope to see you at the next webinar. So, Chimikwech and Bamapi Kwabmin.